talking about. Well, let's just start now. So this is uh, uh, the Nobel Prize in, Visit, in Medicine or Physiology. I don't know why they continue on this with medicine or physiology here. We'll comment on that a little bit later, but there are certain traditions. I mean, uh, Nobel laid down the, the ground rules for the Nobel Prizes, and they don't have a lot of wiggle room. Uh, the Economics Prize came in uh, later. And, uh, but, uh, um, so just for you, some of you may not know me, so my name is Bill Brown, and really welcome here on behalf of the library and Debbie Krause, but also Bell May Elkins and David Elkins, because Bell May does the Literature Prize, and David does the Economics and the Peace Prize. And I do, um, I think, the easiest part which is the science part, except it isn't that easy. It's a bad scramble, I'll tell you, because when they announced them on, uh, I think they started on October the 2nd, it really is a scramble to actually understand the material. Now, I was pretty conversant with this one, but not entirely. And, uh, and sometimes they're really out of my left field, so it's a scramble to actually understand and do justice to the prize. So anyway, it, this is the sixth uh, Nobel Prize um, uh, review, and uh, and it's gone well. I, you know, I I don't know how many of these things uh, you've gone to, but uh, but there is a pattern to these things, and I certainly noticed it in the Chemistry Prize, uh, the Physics Prize, to less extent uh, in the Medicine Prize that we're dealing with right now. Now, just this, this is the, uh, you know, our um, James Webb telescope picture. I mean, it is a stunning picture, isn't it? And uh, it's probably dated to somewhere, um, I mean, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, at least approximately, to the, from the Big Bang to now. So this picture, I mean, it's jam-packed with stars, so you know this isn't in the first uh, several hundred thousand years. So this would have been after the first when at least the first stars are being built. And those, this gaseous cloud that we see with infrared here, um, it's jam-packed with hydrogen, and to some extent helium, and a little tiddly bit of lithium. But no other minerals be, or, or elements beyond that because they haven't been formed yet. Uh, the rest of the elements are made in stars, giant stars. So, what the interesting thing is, though, that this early in the game uh, is jam-packed with stars, absolutely jam-packed. And if you think, uh, now these are the first generation stars. Our sun is the third generation star in our neighborhood. So, to give you a little perspective, they do have a lifetime to them. So, um, that gets us going because I think with a lot of with these Nobel Prizes and thinking more broadly, what we're really talking about with all of this stuff is perspective and storytelling. This is storytelling related to the creation of, of the universe. Today we're talking about the story about uh, early humans and their cousins and what linked them together. So that's another part of the story, but it's all part of a giant story. Uh, so I'll try to tell it as well as I can. Um, there are limits to the Nobel Prize. Uh, it's for sure the Nobel Committee doesn't always get it right. Uh, and, uh, the slippery slope is with literature. I mean, um, the, the New Yorker magazine had a really, uh, in their uh, editorial, really had a dig at them primarily because of the literature prize, because of some of the bizarre awards, or really top-notch people that didn't get one. Um, there are no posthumous awards. I mean, it, I think about this all the time, because many times the award is given to people in their 70s, 80s, 70s and 80s, for work they did 20 or 30 years before that. So you have to live long enough to actually get the award. <laughs> uh, Stephen Hawking did not. And, uh, and there are other examples of that. So, these long intervals, um, and that'll come up next week with, uh, with the physics prize. A limit of three 
Well, listen, with most, uh, I mean, sure, with somebody like uh, Niels Bohr and, uh, and Albert Einstein, especially Albert Einstein, it's a one-man show. Um, so you could award a prize to somebody like that. But what do you do when you have hundreds of people, engineers and, and physicists and various other people working together on something, and then, and then you award it to one or two or three? And often the person who gets it is the manager, the, the overall manager of the thing. I mean, a very important role for sure. But if you're asking where the, the ideas come from and uh, where was that creative stuff, where was that force, probably not with management, um, but, but a, a vital combination. Uh, limit of three, no mechanism of retraction. So if somebody really messes up after they get the award <laughs> and shoots somebody, uh, you can't withdraw the award. No provision for that. Um, this is a bit of a sore point for me. Only three sciences are recognized. So physics, chemistry, and medicine, or physiology. Um, it strikes me that mathematics is very key, uh, certainly for physics, and these days chemistry. And engineering, for absolutely for sure. I mean, I can't think of a physics award in the last uh, several years uh, that hasn't, well, the James Webb Telescope is a classic example of that. And there's going to be a Nobel for the Hubble and the James Webb Telescope at some point. Not, you know, the, the wait around for a few years, but that's what's going to happen. Um, so, um, I'd like to see the engineering sciences recognized, but uh, I don't think they're going to listen to me. Now, let's just, it's always useful to go back and see what they've done in the, in the last few years in this list, and I'm not going to read them all out, but the one that was most interesting to me uh, was Mary Britt Moser and her husband, uh, Ibarg Moser, and their, um, uh, at least on um, Ibarg Moser's career, John O'Keefe was his uh, PhD supervisor. And, and what they did is they showed that the temporal lobe has a uh, position sensing cells that recognize where we are uh, in space and time, and that's what's lost in Alzheimer's disease and, uh, and uh, other, some other dimensions, right? And, and people lose a sense of where they are and how to get to certain places. So, so that's, that's important. Um, but you, uh, if you see what they try to highlight, uh, uh, certainly uh, on the medicine side, uh, public health issues that are very, very common, roundworm disease, malaria, uh, hepatitis, that kind of thing. Cancer therapy is obviously a big target, and certainly was the, for the chemistry prizes in the last few years. So, um, so that's, I'm, well, we don't have to, I, I've always thought that, um, that here, uh, that uh, uh, this is James Allison from Texas, right here on the on the right hand side. But uh, um, I always thought even at the time he looked unwell. Mm -hmm. um, but I checked this morning; he's <laughs> still ticking. <laughs> so um, anyway, pleased about that. But that was about checkpoint inhibitors, and that was a revolution. Yeah, that's been the revolution in cancer therapy. Is this molecular biological approach a highly targeted approach, very specific approach, and um, and that's why there'll probably be more Nobel prizes awarded. I really enjoyed this. But this is one that I really scrambled to understand. It's so basic, the mechanism for sensing oxygen in the environment, uh, and what the level is, and responding to it. Um, this was really clever work by all three people, and I enjoyed finding out about it, but I had no clue before I started out. I do remember that uh, stressor. So, um, discovery of the hepatitis C virus, well, obviously. Now, this was last year. I really liked this one um, last year because these two guys, uh, this was elegant stuff. They tied together the genetics of, of, well, sensation is mediated through special receptors in our spinal cord and in, and in the brain stem. 
and but at the very touchy temperature end of things are receptors. So those receptors are proteins, and there are genes that dictate the shape and the molecular structure of those receptors and make them sensitive to mechanical stimulation or temperature change. They did a great job, and just three months ago, uh, Ardem on the right came out with, uh, with a whole new group. I mean, sensations turning out to be really complex of receptors that were specifically responsive to itch, go figure, mm -hmm. but there are. <laughs> And uh, so uh, they've often been stuck in the same category as pain receptors, but, uh, but apparently not. Now, just to remind you that there are other prizes, I've just mentioned three of them here, but sometimes there are predictors for a Nobel Prize, and the Lasker Prize is one of those. It's very common, at least in a medicine prize, to, for an award to have been made, because their focus is on medicine or health, uh, for a prize, the Lasker Prize to be won, say, two, three years before they get a Nobel Prize. So um, there's an ABLE Prize to try to address this seeming inequity, the issue with mathematics. Uh, so I don't need to say anything more about it because I want to get on to the man of the hour. Um, I really uh, like and admire this guy, Sabate Pabo. He's, uh, he's a Swede. Uh, he's done most of his productive work at the Max Planck Institute, uh, which, where he runs a, a very large laboratory. Um, uh, he's probably the ideal supervisor. He's very savvy. Uh, he looks after people who work with him. He doesn't hog the, the limelight. It's interesting that the Nobel gave this exclusively to him. And that's a reflection that he's totally dominated the field from 1990, late 1980s, to now. Now, there are places all over the world, including China, UK, other places in Europe, the United States, Harvard, uh, who have big labs. But they haven't done much, much beyond him. He's obviously the father figure, but very much involved. So, and he's still young enough, he's 67. So, um, so he often, when you're that senior, uh, you're invited to another institution, and you spend maybe a third of your time there, and that's true with him. Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in, in Japan, that's, that's a common thing for people of his kind of age group. Uh, so, and in, a, in their own language, the Nobel uh, Committee, for his discoveries concerning the genome of, ext of extinct hominins and human evolution. So that's really what this is about. Um, so let's just move along and see. Well, there he is, uh, no surprise. When I first looked at this, oh my god, I think he's got a big hair run at the back. He doesn't, that's just something stuck on the wall or something like that. <laughs> kind of. And, uh, but he's a fun guy. I mean, people like working with this guy. But he's also diligent. He's very, very tough on the details. Um, but, but easy to work with at a, at a personal life. He's a great team leader. And you'll see what happens at the <laughs> Karolinsky. Anyone who wins a Nobel Prize at the Max Planck, this is what happens to you. They throw you in this pond, which doesn't look particularly clean. Um, now, Max Planck, it's Max Planck, Max Planck, the famous Max Planck. Remember, I, I did a series on the Camelot uh, period in physics from 1900 to 1930, the beginning of quantum physics, or what we would call quantum mechanics, which is what next week is about. Um, Max Planck was the reluctant person who, very conservative by nature, um, very much in the common German mold of the day, very thorough, inching his way forward, and, and he couldn't solve black body radiation. It, 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 that was a really a sticker for him, until he grudgingly acknowledged or, or adopted a quantum concept into his equations and he almost apologized for it when he presented his studies. Well, there was no reservation on Einstein's part. 
he was already there uh, with the quantum nature of light and, for that matter, all energy. So a difference in the men who became, I might say, very good friends, close friends. So that's Max Planck, the beginning of the Max Planck Institute that's dumping him in the water here. So, uh, well, we already did the next one. So this is 2020, and uh, Dudna, Jennifer Dudna, and Emmanuel Carpentier made two really uh, uh, capable women. And uh, one, in, one in France and, uh, and the other in the United States. Um, and they really have moved chemistry forward. In fact, some of the stuff that you're going to hear about a little bit later depends on gene editing, uh, on manipulating the genome. So, uh, so I, I can't talk about this without a brief little review of, of genetics. So, anyway, so here we are. We've, it's like a piece of wool kind of pulled out of a ball, strung it all out, and uh, widened it out. There's the Watson and Frick double helix. There are the bases, the four different bases, kind of batched off against one another. And, um, and genes have starts and stops to tell you when, when to start paying attention for a particular gene and when to stop doing so. So that's a very simple model, but it's a good way to start. But there are some things that we need to know about genes. Well, first of all, there are a hell of a lot of them. There are 25,000 plus of protein encoding genes, meaning genes that dictate this, the, the uh, creation of a single protein. And there are a lot of uh, gene protein, <coughs> protein encoding genes that cause diseases, human diseases. I mean, it's Korea, it's kind of one, one common one. So, but it was interesting, it, it, you only have to go back about 10 years in the literature, and um, that was about all people kind of looked at, the protein encoding genes, that was the focus. And they tended to look at the rest of the genome as junk, kind of acquired over millions of years that life has been around. Well, it's not junk. It's actually the very important stuff. It's the uh, kind of signaling genes that kind of control families of genes and tell them when to start and stop and orchestrate them. Now, no surprise that this should be so. After all, you start out with, uh, with an egg, a fertilized egg. It differentiates into hundreds and even thousands of different cells. That's all under the signaling genes control, right? So. Um, and every cell in your body has the same genome. It's, it's just that if it's a liver cell, it's not paying any attention to the kidney parts of the genome or the brain parts of the genome. It's only paying a part, uh, attention to those parts of the structure of the kidney cell. I mean, I'm really simplifying here, but you, you can see what I'm saying here. So, and genes, I mean, I have an address in Niagara on the Lake. Genes have addresses. They're on certain parts of the, of the chromosome, and there's a certain site along that, and they have neighbors that they cooperate with and that they work with, and, uh, and genes that kind of tell them when to start, start, uh, start and stop. So they, they, genes should be thought of as families, as uh, societies, as Jennifer Dugna puts it, as societies uh, within societies. That's a good way to think about it. And, um, and, and one caution with gene editing comes up, a gene may have different functions. And if you don't know about uh, the other functions and you edit out the gene for seemingly a good reason, you'll knock it out for the other things and you don't know about it, so that's an adverse effect, right? Uh, so that's very important. Also, um, Remember I mentioned perspective? Many genes have ancient, ancient histories. They've been around a long, long time. They go back to the time of, uh, say, four billion years ago, when there were the first cells had formed. Some of those families of genes back then are still around now, especially if they 
if they were ones that at that at that that played important roles that continued on, like uh, providing high energy uh, phosphate for, for cells, or the creation of cell membranes, that kind of thing. So, and they had that whole DNA to messenger RNA to protein stuff. I mean, that's a that's an ancient story uh, that's just been constantly re reworked in different species since. So um, it's just they're the same molecular rules in play. So at a molecular biological level, our common ancestors are actually very, very deep. Okay, maybe not behaviorally, maybe not in our brains, but from a from a molecular chemical point of view, yes. All right. All right. So humans with heritages outside of Africa contain one to two percent Neanderthal. That would probably include most of us in this room that don't trace our heritage, at least for the last several hundred thousand years, or maybe billion years, to Africa. And, uh, and so we probably, one to two percent, if we were an Australian Aboriginal, we might carry two to six, maybe four to six percent Denisovan, Denisovan uh, DNA. That's the, those that, that's the cousin, mysterious cousin species to the Anderthals. So um, mutations, it's important to say something about mutations. Uh, well, I'm quoting right from Jennifer, great source. By the way, she's worth watching on YouTube. She's very good. She, she's good with the public. She, she knows how to explain stuff. And uh, so I would go on YouTube. Anyway, mutations, um, copying errors. I mean, it's amazing that the system works as well as it does because people have likened this to, uh, to uh, somebody, some monk somewhere copying the Bible. And, uh, and for sure, they will describe, will make mistakes. They do. And even several monks looking at the same piece make mistakes. Anyone looking at sacred scriptures realizes that. And it's not just a letter, it might be a word, it could even be the sentence. And uh, so, um, copying errors are common. We get our DNA in two sources. One, uh, in females, uh, well, all of us, but uh, at, least, at least with the egg, uh, uh, the maternal, the, the egg contains uh, a lot of mitochondria, hundreds to thousands of them. These are little cylindrical things that create high energy phosphate and they're outside the nucleus. There are only 37 genes. Um, they date back probably uh, maybe, um, I'm going to say uh, maybe three billion years ago, uh, when maybe a little bit later than that, when, uh, when uh, two of the very early kind of cell types joined together and, uh, and one of them became mitochondria and the other became the cell as we know it with the nucleus of mitochondria and the cytoplasm. But in other words, mitochondria are relatively simple stretches of DNA. I mean, they don't have thousands and thousands of genes. They've got 37. It's always 37. It's been 37 for a long, long time. Okay. Um, so, for the early exploration, Hubble's work, the easiest way to go at it was through mitochondrial DNA rather than uh, looking at nuclear DNA. It's far more complex to look at nuclear DNA. But uh, it's a little unnerving to read that mutations, um, where is it now? Here we are, yeah. That, um, uh, where am I? What am I showing you? Oh, okay. All right. So, um, look at this. Roughly one million mutations take place throughout the body per second. Per second. That's Jennifer Duke. Um, in intestinal epithelium, ne nearly every single letter of the genome has mutated at least once by the age of 60. Now, when I see something like that, what do I see as risk of cancer? Every time mutations take place, there's a chance that it'll be a bad one. 
yeah and even the sex cells that uh, that you know um, uh, the sperm and, and the eggs develop mutations before they match up okay before they connect so mutations are the order of the day um, now let's see now now we get into the stuff here this whole business of common ancestors all right so in 1987 there was a really important paper that came out remember reference to mitochondrial Eve yeah so they mapped they they looked at uh, in living humans a sample of several hundred uh, humans and they looked at the differences in the mitochondrial DNA and then calculated well what's uh, what's the chance of a of a, of a mutation taking place and therefore figured out well how far back do I have to go before the clock started moving on these changes and and it turned out to be around 150,000 years ago in Africa there wasn't one mitochondrial Eve there were probably hundreds of women um, uh, hundreds if not a, if not a few thousand mitochondrial Eves but um, so that's important. Um, now we look at our common ancestors here. So this is just something to go through because uh, um, these are in millions of years. So the first primates. Well, when Earth was struck by that large asteroid ju just off Mexico back 66,000 years ago, and the dinosaurs, except for birds, went extinct, Okay, that's when primates really got going. Now they existed before then, but now the niches had opened up and they could rapidly evolve. So the first primates, kind of little lemur-like creatures, uh, nocturnal, I go back say 56, 65,000 years ago. Chimpanzees, the common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans, six to seven million years ago. Now that sounds like a lot, it is not. Given that the Earth is, uh, is what, about 4.5 billion years old, this is a blink <clears throat> on that larger time frame. Okay, Our genus, Homo, uh, three million years ago. And modern humans, the common ancestor of us, with Neanderthals and Denosovans would go back to 0 0.9, 0 0.7 million years ago. Um, and Neanderthals and, and uh, Denisovans kind of split around 0 0.6 million years ago. That, so that a uh, long time ago, admittedly a long time ago, but uh, the, the human story is not all that long. Well, there is a history to this. Anyone who remembers Bill Clinton will remember him uh, uh, congratulating the, the group uh, when the first human genome was uh, you know, was uh, publicized, or uh, and and uh, not when it, it was launched in 1990, but it was 2001 uh, when they had a reasonable genome, but it was anything but complete at that time. And so the first sequences were published in 2001. There have always been issues, well, uh, who do they actually look like? Uh, who look at? Were they just looking at whites, people that looked like us in this room, or did they, did, were they more inclusive? Well, they weren't. And uh, so they've been very intentional about that, about looking at other populations in the world just to see, well, what is the genetic diversity across groups? And it's not even over. Yeah, I hold this out of the Journal of Science, and I might say, if you look at uh, the Nobel Award this year for him, two-thirds of the papers referenced are from nature or science. Uh, so those, those, they should actually be here in the library, because uh, they're very high-quality journals. But look at this. 2000, uh, this year, the most complete human genome yet is revealed. Well, it's still not done. So it's a target, 
a moving target, but it's becoming complete. So it's, it's um, and, and the other thing is that here we are, epigenetic thing. I mean, uh, you, can, you can silence genes by attaching chemical groups to them and, uh, and produce so-called epigenetic changes that without any change in the genes themselves, the DNA looks the same, but the organism isn't behaving the same because certain genes have been turned off or turned on. That's the whole field of epigenetics. So on top of the gene. So, um, all right, well, now let's go on here. Now, this, I like this, I, I took this right out of the, uh, right out of the Nobel. Um, they have one for the press. They have one that's uh, for the public, which is quite readable. And then they have the scientific paper. And um, so I work between the latter two. But I have lots of other sources to look at. So DNA, it's a kind of a nice little diagram because uh, it makes the point that uh, nuclear DNA um, uh, contains most of the genetic information, which is about just shared with you. Mitochondrial DNA is much simpler, but there are many more copies of it. So, so when a cell dies, there might be several hundred copies of mitochondrial DNA, but only one copy of the nuclear DNA. You see the point? Okay, so your chances of finding ancient mitochondrial DNA are much higher. And after death, DNA is degraded. Well, uh, that's what uh, this, this is what it's all about today. And, uh, and it's very easily contaminated uh, with bacteria in the soil uh, and other sources. And so we'll just talk about that. Um, uh, uh, this just, um, I think we've already said it up on this. So let's go to. Now, what are the challenges with DNA? I mean, um, uh, Pubble, when he started out, his, his original interest was in sequencing the genome of, uh, ancient, uh, of uh, Egyptian mummies. That was the original idea back in uh, the 1980s. He got a PhD on that, barely, <laughs> uh, because it was very hard to salvage. And why? Because it, could, it not only was it badly degraded and fragmented and broken up, but it was contaminated by everyone who had handled the stuff. And, uh, and he realized then that he really had to reshape this. If this was going to work, uh, he had to rethink uh, how to rescue ancient DNA. So, um, so the challenges here Finding suitable high-value DNA. Uh, one of the problems that uh, is that there, the sample size is often very small. It's fragmented, broken up. There are stretches that are that are kind of missing. Bits uh, and pieces. It's like assembling a giant jigsaw puzzle uh, without all the without all the pieces. And um, and contamination by uh, by bacteria, and and especially the humans handling the stuff. And, uh, and this is, and then real problems, I mean, it's very hard to find ancient DNA in hot, wet, tropical climates. It just doesn't survive. They survived, it's probably one of the reasons why we've got as much Neanderthal DNA as we have, because they've lived their lives in cooler, colder climates. So, um, now, what were his solutions? This is why he got the Nobel Prize, at least half of why he got the Nobel Prize, because he really bore down on this rigorous exclusion of contamination from present-day bacteria and the investigators by using specially designed clean rooms. I mean, these are cleaner than the, than the rooms uh, where they prepared the, um, the uh, uh, where they prepare satellites in. But they, they have to be clean. No bugs in them, or translate as no DNA in them, or proteins or anything else. 
And then they used, if you remember in the early days of the COVID, uh, we had PC, PCR tests. So that's the uh, polymerase chain reaction is a way of amplifying the DNA or RNA in that case. And, um, um, and, um, and then one of the other things is to develop computer algorithms to help you put the puzzle together to look for pieces that probably match. I mean, when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of genes, that's a real problem. Uh, finding how the pieces come together and finding out where the gaps are. Now, the more DNA you sequence, the more you find bits and pieces that would fit in. So this is a puzzle that, that's, that's, uh, that's solved using many sources of Neanderthal DNA in human DNA. You follow me? That's important because right at the bottom I say the collection and development of libraries of DNA. Uh, so you now have a source. So if you, if you find some DNA and you do a genome-wide search and there are kind of holes in it, you can look for reference sources in the library and fill in, provisionally at least, what it might have looked like. That's what the libraries are for. And, um, and also, you can recognize the DNA or RNA of organisms. So if you see a certain pattern, oh, is that bacteria? Ignore that. Okay. So that's what the library is all about. Now, let's get on to the stuff that probably might be a little more interesting to Neanderthals. Okay. Well, the first one was found in the Neander Valley in Germany in 1856. Um, Neanderthals uh, expanded widely uh, through Eurasia. Um, um, they probably were never many Neanderthals, and they tended to live in relatively small groups, uh, probably 20 to 50. Uh, humans are up there 100 to 150. This puts them at obvious risk, doesn't it, for genetic diversity and, and for the accumulation of bad mutations. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that happened to woolly mammoths and, and some other ancient species that essentially die out for lack of genetic diversity. Um, they bred with both humans and, and Denisovans. Uh, Denisovans are a cousin species that was discovered by uh, Pavel and, and his group uh, in a cave in, in Siberia. And, um, and they were really surprised. It was just a, all they had, no fossils. They just had a fingertip and took the DNA. First of all, the mitochondrial DNA from that, and recognized that was unique. It wasn't Neanderthal, it certainly wasn't human. But it was close to both. And then they got the autosomal DNA, enough autosomal DNA, and they realized, okay, we've got a new The very first species recognized without the fossils evidence. Now we have a jaw or a mandible from a putative uh, Denisovan. And then, uh, what was it, uh, a year ago, in China, yes, a year ago, a little over a year ago, a skull was found in China that would go back, say, around 400, 500,000 years ago with features that would certainly fit with, with um, uh, a Denisovan, but no DNA was found, or it hasn't been reported. Um, uh, there, I wanted, this is, uh, there was a, there's been a question, how long have modern humans, we speak of humans in our history as anatomically modern humans and behaviorally modern humans. You can recognize right off the bat that it might not be the same. Well, how far back does ana, do anatomically modern humans, meaning skulls that look like ours, a kind of, you know, well-developed forehead, a globular skull, 
and, uh, and the rest of the skeletal features very consistent with, with, with modern humans. That goes back in the record in, uh, in uh, Africa, in Northeast Africa, to maybe um, uh, 100, 150,000 years ago. But, so not long in, in the record but at least matches the mitochondrial DNA data of the common ancestor. There are skulls from Morocco that have been claimed to be the leading edge of modern humans, but I don't think so, and I don't think you do either, just looking at this, because this is one of the skulls in Morocco, and you see these heavy brows. I mean, that's a Neanderthal feature. And, um, and the receding forehead, and the and the um, and the skull tends to be more longitudinal. It doesn't have that kind of typical globular shape. So I'm not I, I'm not sure, and I think others are also about the about Morocco. So I, I think the behaviorally. Oh, sorry. Now here's that cave, or the cave site that in. Uh, it is so that in um, uh, in Russia and um, and there are actually two sites. There's another site where Denisovan has been found. Um, uh, they don't. They they uh, unlike Neanderthals, which seem to spread everywhere except Africa. And there's very little evidence that any of them ever went back to Africa. They evolved outside of Africa, but they didn't. It wasn't a two-way traffic. The traffic was out of Africa, but not back into Africa. Um, so, um, but there's that the cave in the inside, and um, and this is this is what you can do when you get enough genomes together. You can begin to string them out and just like a Darwinian tree, figure out common ancestors, common roots. And these are kind of the various sites where, uh, where um, uh, DNA has been uh, uh, rescued and, uh, and sequenced. And these are various sites, Neanderthal sites. So Neanderthal sites are kind of through Europe, but also in, in Asia. So they went a fair distance. Now, um, now this is an interesting one. Ignore this. This is really... What we're looking at here is the number of differences. So if you compare human to human, these are the number of differences in the, in the genome. So it's kind of the median, where the mean is around 10%, or at least 10 uh, uh, kind of sites that are a little bit different and, uh, between humans. So it's not much spread, but very different. If you compare humans to Neanderthals, uh, well, it's almost double that. The differences, and if you compare, as you might expect, modern humans to chimps, it's way up here. Now recognize that 98% of the genome of chimpanzees is almost the same as ours. So 2% makes a huge difference, doesn't it? If it happens to involve the right things, which we're going to get to in just a second. So here just this came out of the New York Times. You know, the New York Times loves the, law, the, uh, the, the human um, story stuff. Uh, they really do. And, um, and there was, there's a cave, there are two caves, not far apart, but two caves in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, Siberia, that, that um, one of them they found in a single layer sediment, single layer, 11 uh, Neanderthal um, separate genomes, or they, they salvaged it alone. And such was the detail that they got that they could tell that there was a father and a daughter and another couple of very close relatives. There was another cave, not too far away from here, with two dating from the same period, around 50,000 years ago. By the way, Neanderthals, just for the record, disappeared off the map around 40,000 years ago, uh, about the time that Europe, uh, modern humans had swamped 
Europe, and were beginning to create a lot of the cave art. So the Neanderthals were gone by that time. And it may have been an overlap of two to 5,000 years, but not much. So here's the reconstructed picture of the Neanderthal father and daughter. Well, how do you know it's father and daughter? Well, number one, these genomes are almost exactly the same. But the mitochondrial DNA carried by the two are different. So it can't, they cannot be siblings. Okay. Or they'd be carrying the same maternal mitochondrial DNA. So we know there's a father and a daughter here. So isn't that incredible that you can reach back 50,000 years and begin to uh, figure out even a family or a group of closely related people. It's incredible. Um, and the curve of these discoveries is almost exponentially up because the techniques are now being widely applied by many more groups. Um, there's the cave. Don't know that I'd want to live there, but anyway, <laughs> that's where they were. Um, and um, so, what about that, that cave? It's just to recap, it's a, it was probably a seasonal home for the Neanderthals. DNA from 11 individuals in the one cave, uh, six adults and five children. The fossils were trapped in a layer of dirt at about the same time. But the important thing is their autosomal DNA was very similar, two of which shared enough to be a father and daughter or two sibs. But I just told you that the mitochondrial DNA was different, so we know it's father and daughter. But this is the thing, this is the literally the killer. There was relatively little genetic diversity suggesting a high level of interbreeding and group size is small. That's a fatal formula for survival of any species. So it's not a good idea to resurrect uh, a bird or some animal or a Neanderthal unless you are prepared to resurrect a whole lot of brothers and sisters out there in some diversity. Otherwise, it's cruelty. It makes no sense. The, in fact, the entire population of Neanderthals in Siberia has been estimated to be roughly a thousand back then. So we're talking about very small groups dispersed over a large area. Uh, very vulnerable to bad weather, stuff going on. In fact, they think that this, they probably all died uh, one winter of starvation. Now, there's the big picture on the right that uh, you know, the chimpanzee and, um, and uh, the branch leading to us and, and uh, our cousins, and then, um, and then uh, chimps. Yeah, well, somebody asked me a good question the other day. Well, how come, uh, gee, if humans, if uh, Neanderthals and Homo erectus, Homo erectus we got around, um, how come chimps were stuck in the Congo? Why didn't they ever kind of leave and continue to evolve? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, one of the answers, and I'm not sure it's a, the right one, but one of the answers has been, well, um, that kind of tropical environment, what they eat a lot of is fruit. And then there's a lot of fruit there. So why go anywhere else? Um, there's no nothing pushing them to, to go anywhere and therefore to evolve. Some animals don't evolve. Sharks haven't evolved very much. Um, Zebras have not evolved very much. So when you dig up a strelopis from three million years ago, uh, you can still find a zebra skeleton that looks pretty much what it is now. So not all species are evolving at the same rate or at all, uh, in many cases, if their environment is, is a successful one for them, if it's working for them. Okay. And um, now, oh, I only put this slide in to remind me, don't, don't even bother looking at the slide. One of the other virtues of 
ancient DNA studies is that they often show ghost species, changes in the DNA with no matching fossils. So we're beginning to realize that this whole story is much more complex than we thought based on the genetic record. Now whether we find those fossils or not, we, we might, but with industrialization now in Africa, that kind of thing, I, I don't know, but, uh, but it's a really interesting point. Um, and this is our spread, our ancestors. So um, uh, this is, these are the earliest ones, uh, the out of Africa in white here, uh, spreading across into what is uh, Saudi Arabia here, uh, northern India, reaching uh, East Asia, some of them even getting down to the, uh, the south, you know, the islands to the south. Uh, question mark Australia, but anyway, yeah. The, the blue arrows are more modern. That's the that's the movement. Of, well, so the older one is maybe a hundred to uh, one hundred and fifty thousand years ago, and we can see that because this glacial interglacial period. It's a period when when Saudi Arabia had lakes uh, and was warm, and there were lots of trees and water around and vegetation, and therefore animals. That's when people migrated. Okay, when, when, when it was like it is now in Saudi Arabia, who would go? It was all desert. Uh, so, um, anyway, that's the general pattern, but, uh, but humans, uh, you don't need to see that. Oh, this is interesting. So, this is, um, uh, the, this is uh, Carthage, uh, and um, where? Just find my way in here, because this is this is an interesting one. Yeah, here we are. So it, it, this is a mass grave from the Second Battle of uh, Ibera in Sicily, 409 BC. One quarter of the combatants were thought to be mercenaries, and how would they know that? And mapping the DNA and finding that the DNA didn't come from Greece the people actually running the island. Uh, and, uh, and so these were people, these were paid people, again, troops. And, um, and that compared to two-thirds were, um, were mercenaries in the first battle, uh, seven decades before. So there they're all about, by the way, that's a horse. They're all lined up in there. At least they gave them a burial. But then, um, haven't we seen that now in Ukraine? Uh, them being dumped in sites like that, it, that's what struck me uh, when I look at it. Uh, but anyway, um, and then here's the Black Death. Um, and and uh, the bodies kind of laid out. Well, it, they, you know, the Black Death, it, let me just go, up, go back, we may come back, but here we are. First of all, I like this, it's a McMaster study. This is her, Jennifer's PhD thesis. It just got published in Nature. Couldn't happen to a better person. Uh, and a high profile thing for a PhD. So in the mid 1300s, the Black Death killed 30 to 50% of all people living in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. That's it. Wow. Now there's an epidemic, or a pandemic, wow. <laughs> Um, what they did is they examined DNA from bones, 318 skeletons from burial sites in London, England, and I think uh, several graveyards in, in London and outside of London, and five sites in Denmark, so a lot of skeletons put them together. And they looked at people, DNA before the plague, during the plague that obviously died, and after the plague. and compared the DNA. And the interesting thing is there, was a, there were multiple changes in the genome, but the one that stood out was one gene, ERAP2, which codes for a protein that helps immune cells recognize and fight viruses, but also resist the bacteria causing the plague. 
if they compared the genome before and after in survivors, that gene, two alleles, meaning um, two copies of it, of that, um, were present, say, in 60% of people versus 30% before. Now, why is that relevant to today? Because that, uh, that particular gene increases our risk of autoimmune diseases. And that is, uh, and that's one thing with, uh, you remember I mentioned that 2% or 1 or 2% of our DNA is Neanderthal. Part of that DNA increases our risk to uh, autoimmune diseases. So it wasn't, it's not a great inheritance. <laughs> and um, we're on time. So I'll just move along quickly. I, I just put this up because this is an interesting study. You know, not all invasions are destructive, and this goes back to the early Middle Ages, and uh, so this is the migration or uh, from uh, Northern Europe, Denmark, to places mostly in Eastern England, and, and as it was recorded in the time, it seemed to be a destructive one, being they moved in, um, created havoc, displaced everyone, and, uh, but that isn't what happened. These are families that migrated, farmers, and, and some warriors, and they merged with the, and, and to this day, people in those areas in England carry a fairly high um, uh, genetic heritage from those areas, Anglo-Saxon areas. So it's interesting how the genomes teach us history, right? So um, now this we get on to the last part. What makes humans different from other hominins and an animals? Well, uh, this is one of my consuming interests <laughs> over, the, over the years. The, the obvious thing is look at the complexity of our cultures, our social structures, and our capacity to communicate, uh, for sure. And there are certainly genetic differences between uh, Neanderthals and modern humans, no doubt about that. Um, but there's got to be more to it than just that. Well, one thing to look at are burials. Where are people are people buried intentionally, or they just kind of dump where they lie, or they, you know, show some care. No predator marks. On the, on, on, the, on the fossils, they're not chewed up, scavenged, that kind of thing. And, uh, well, look at, yeah, you probably can't see it here, but look at some of, some of these burials go back 500, 400,000 years ago. That's almost to the beginning of Neanderthals. It's long before we came on stage, intentional burials sites. And I would imagine, it's in my imagination, there must have been some ceremony surrounding that, and uh, here's another one, 850 to 780,000 years ago. Long time, Rising Star Cave down in South Africa. I can tell uh, these had brains about the size of a chimpanzee, not much larger, uh, but, but their skeletons are, in many ways, were very human-like, but not the size of the brain. And they found this cave with a whole bunch of skulls in it. Um, so, um, anyway, early grave sites. Okay, so, well, here we are. A human skull, a Neanderthal skull. We've already talked about this, but um, the frontal development, a lot more here than there. It's globular. It's not longitudinal length the way it is in Neanderthals. Notice the Neanderthal orbit is larger. I can say the, the, the um, the space through which the optic nerve goes back to, you know, from the from the eyeball uh, to the brain is uh, about twice as large. So, and they have this occipital bun at the back, so their visual system may actually be more developed than us. But the prefrontal motor cortex, the stuff that probably differentiates us from them or other species before that, um, is clearly not there. 
And um, so there are, but, uh, but you know, this is like phrenology to be preparing skulls. So um, uh, there's, there are ways of doing it. What, um, I'm gonna, no, this is not, oh, go back here. One way to do this is to use these mini brains. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say this? It, you can take an adult, you can take adult uh, skin cells, say fibroblasts, and, uh, and tweak them fairly simply with four chemicals, uh, and they become stem cells. Then you can reverse engineer it, change direction, uh, to where they become progenitor cells for the brain, meaning the first cells in brain development. Well, you can do that for humans, and you can do it for Neanderthals, and you can actually grow them in a dish. And they create a very early level of, uh, early stage of development of neocortex that looks very much like ours, but it's at an early stage. Uh, well, you can see the obvious potential. You could put a Neanderthal gene into a human brain organoid to see what advantage or dis disadvantage that has, or you could put the human version of that gene into the Neanderthal growing brain and see if that offers any advantage. Well, guess what it does? So if you if that's what these organoids look like. I mean, they don't look like brains, but it's a very early stage in, our, in development. There's the, the pluripotent stem cells here, and, and that's kind of the early stage of the kind of uh, layered neocortex here. Um, and, and here's the result. I mean, I, I kept this simple. But there is, there is one gene, and count on it, if a gene acts early in development, it can have an enormous impact on development. Added in later, um, maybe not so much. So, what has happened here with Neanderthals? There's one gene, same gene, but the protein it makes uh, has it's exactly the same except for one amino acid. The Neanderthal version has uh, lysine, and the modern humans have arginine. Well, this is what happens if you kind of put the Neanderthal gene into a human brain organoid, smaller, less developed brain nerve cells. We're talking cortical, neocortical cells. Mm. And uh, so, and the human uh, version of the same gene, only one of amino acid. Remember, these, these proteins have hundreds and even thousands of amino acids. Just one makes a huge difference to what happens with the brain. So, um, that's, uh, and now I really blow your mind, uh, now that I've got your attention, because people, thought, well, you know, this is a fairly model, it's pretty limited, it, it, it doesn't do anything. Actually, there are two things about that. Uh, I just read today before I came over here. Those organoids can actually be taught to play games. Oh, my God. <laughs> and they do it appropriately. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the other things, just to prolong the development stage, they've taken to implanting, say this is a human organoid, into an early rat brain, very young child rat, and it will actually merge. Now this is a, uh, uh, I mean the immune system has been knocked out here, so it's not rejected. So it will actually form connections, the rat brain's neurons will grow into the implant, nerve cells in the implant will grow into the rat brain and they will actually make meaningful connections. And if you put them in the right place, if you put them in the right place, they will actually say, as the, the, like these whiskers, that are very, very sensitive, right? And rats, that's how they explore their world uh, in the dark. And um, so some of the, these organoids actually respond 
to moving of whiskers, and they'll actually, if you shine light on these things, they'll actually move the whiskers. So they're, they are meaningful connections. It's scary because uh, I think, um, I don't know where this is going. I know, I know, I know, I know that I know it's possible to do these things. We know it's possible to do it, but should they be doing these things? That's a whole other thing. But does that mean that now you can teach rats to play video games? Is that what you're trying to say? No. Well, I've added, I've, I've added, and yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is. It's farcical in some ways, but it's a, It's the same kind of alarm that came up at the time of Jennifer Dugas, the gene, gene editing story. About the ethics, and um, you know, do, do we do we need limitations on these kinds of studies? And because they're obviously pushing the limit and seeing what they can get away with, and working with species, at least the level of rats that are not humans and are not about to become humans. But um, but on the other hand, technology that's worked out at that level, and then of course in the grant submission that goes in and. And if you look at the paper, in the paper of nature, it's the usual kind of stuff. Well, uh, this would be good for people with strokes, with destroyed parts of the brain, so we could implant, and do it, after all, we're doing heart transplants, kidney transplants, pancreatic transplants, why not do a brain transplant? Mm -hmm. Well, it's crazy, but, but it might get you the grant. But it might get you the grant. Or people with Parkinson's disease, where they, uh, Substantia nigra is kind of wiped out. Why not implant an organoid specifically designed to be substantial nigral mm -hmm. cells, and uh, maybe that would help? You know, I, I don't know. Have they so, done that? Have they done that, or is that just future? <coughs> well, they did. Uh, in a way, they did uh, years ago. I think the first studies were done in Mexico about 20 years ago of implanting. Um, um, substantial nigral cells into the brain and they seem to work but uh, but they didn't last long and uh, so I mean it, it kind of makes sense um, uh, anyway it, it, I, I, I just put that at the end because the reason why I put that in is because uh, is this whole business of what makes us human. And therefore, this conversation we're having now is a human conversation about this, isn't it? And so we're looking at it. And, and, and we should exercise some control ourselves over what, what happens. But a lot of times, we don't even know what's going on. Uh, or we don't know enough about it to do anything. I, I will say that the impact, uh, the, the impact on gene editing has been very real. I mean, China's pulled in its tethers, or at least publicly, uh, on this kind of stuff. So anyway, I mentioned close out with this because it's an interesting one about long-term care. Um, this is 31,000 years old. This was uh, we don't know what happened to this child, but whatever. It must have been a severe injury to the foot and, and distal lower leg. Um, the very the, the damaged foot was uh, amputated. And the person apparently lived for another six, six, six to nine years in a, in a small group. They obviously had done it well because there's no evidence of infection, chronic infection, in the, in the tibia and fibula here, the, the stumps of them. So, and it obviously didn't bleed to death. Now, this compares with a death rate with amputation before the Boer War of 50%. Okay, so this was, I would guess, whoever did this was quite skilled. And I don't know what the tools were that he or she had available uh, through using plants or whatever, but he really or, you know, got through this. And furthermore, couldn't make his or her way 
uh, on their own. So somebody, the group, must have looked after this person. There are many examples of that in early modern humans and Neanderthals of severely disabled members of a group and in chimpanzees and whales of long-term care over a long, over a, well, long-term care um, long before we think we invented morals or ethics, we did not. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Just to add to that, I read somewhere, not, not that recently, quite a while ago, dinosaurs, there's evidence that dinosaurs did that with each other. Yeah. That they must have fed an injured member of their herd because they were obviously injured for a long time and there was a sam uh, examples of healing that would have only happened if the others had taken care of it. So to say that we're a moral species and we own that, as you were saying, they're proving more and more that that's not... It's strictly human trait, necessarily. It is not a human trait. Yeah. For, for sure it isn't. Yeah. And we know the bad part of it, because we're reminded of that every day in Ukraine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we see the other side, too. So anyway, that's, that's it. Um, he, this guy, uh, uh, Pablo, he just dominated this whole field. Um, and uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable that he didn't share the prize. They gave it to him. I think, from what I know, he deserved it. Uh, absolutely. Um, Jane, you had a question? No, no, I didn't. Oh, you didn't have a question. <laughs> You're intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, uh, so, uh, yeah. I've got a question. It's just uh, off yeah. the wall a bit. But uh, recently, we were in northern Italy, and uh, a number of us visited uh, uh, Balsano, where they have the ice man, okay, mm -hmm. which is uh, perfectly preserved. And uh, I'm sure they've done DNA work on that. I, I'm sure they have. Have you heard anything about that one? Uh, I'm going to say yes, but I don't. I can't remember the details of it. Yes, yes yeah. because I think that's probably. But, I, but we're talking five, five eight thousand years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and this is the one who had a wound. He was shot from yes. behind. And uh, the thing landed in a, a rib, I think. And uh, I think it may have been murder. Yeah, we, we, all, we, all, yeah, we think so. It's one of those mysteries, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I mean, just think it, about the the DNA in this case yeah. because it's so well preserved. It would be very well preserved. Yeah, I would think. It's, yeah, yeah. And uh, and lots of it. Yeah, and found in. Yeah, in case the nights, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pablo's first DNA from from uh, uh, Neanderthal came from that first skull or skeleton from the Neander Valley, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the first sample he had of uh, mitochondrial DNA, and they just drilled into the skull. Now, it's also very diplomatic. I can tell you that in this field. Uh, some people have, uh, in the field have been very aggressive about going after fossils without giving credit to the fossil people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, I th and I think the Nobel Committee saw that and deliberately did not reward that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but Pablo has been really good about that right from the get-go. And uh, so people work with him. And it's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, anything else? Yeah. I just wondered about Egypt and the studies that started yeah. all of this a long time yeah. ago. Whether or not there's the conditions for getting DNA samples are have they followed the the rulers in Egypt to see if there is family relationships over long periods of time. You know, um, I don't know, but I if you come next week, I'll look that up. Because that's an obvious one, isn't it? If you don't talking, come next week, will you still look it up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because because that goes back, uh, we're, we're talking uh, three, 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's not long. It's also a dry climate. Mm -hmm. um, so 
reasonable conditions. The problem would be contamination on the site, and uh, and so many of those tombs have been right. raided. Yeah. Yeah. But still, you know, um, in the early days, they used well a bubble right into the skull. But now, some of the best sites uh, you wouldn't think of. Um, they involve the uh, three bones in the middle ear. And um, where there's enough DNA, well protected, and at the base of the skull, a peacher skull, is very vascular, has a lot of bone marrow. That's a great site too. So not the obvious sites, and also the technology has moved along so well, they can pluck the DNA out of the soil. They don't need a fossil. Um, in fact, the sediment provides them with the age because they can see time uh, or date, the stuff above, the stuff below, and so you get a date. And if you could recognize the DNA of all the other possible animals that might have been wandering around, because you've got genomes on them, you can use your algorithms to take that stuff out of there. And then you're only dealing with human contamination. And so um, the stuff I showed you about the cave in, in Russia, in Siberia with the 11 uh, uh, people. Um, some of that stuff came from the, uh, that, that wasn't from fossils, it came, came from the sediment. Hmm? And my follow-up question was related to fossilization. Yes. So, in, for example, in Sterkfontein in South Africa, where they're going back 2.3, 2.5 million yeah, years, million. And they have found evidence of burial areas in those caves. Is there any DNA that's recoverable from old calcified uh, fossils? The oldest rescued DNA goes back about a million years. Yeah. But, you know, they keep pushing the limit. Mm. Um, I mean, it was really just a few people doing this. And now there are a lot more people doing it. So I would think that date's going to get pushed back. And um, uh, so, and, and the story will become, um, for everyone, a lot richer for it because we'll have many more genomes. And let's face it, you can't just look at DNA. You have to look at the behavior, the setting, if there are any fossils, uh, what other materials around the site to tell you something about the, the, the people. I mean, what were they doing? What are, they, what are the tools that they had? That Russian site that I referred to has something like 70,000 tools in, in, uh, in that cave and the other one, the two of them combined. So a lot of material. This is just the genetic stuff. But if you're going to build a picture, you need more in the picture than the genome. And they recognize that. And that's why they recognize that they have to work with with people. It's, it's really adding tools to the fossil hunters, but it's also filling out stuff that, that the genome can't tell you uh, on, on its own. So, so we'll see, but uh, there's one very interesting one. I, I don't want to hold anyone here, but, but um, you know, the, uh, remember the, the biblical famine. Well, I just read a paper from Nature that goes back, kind of overlaps with that period in history. It was a devastating famine. Everywhere, Middle East, Mesopotamia, and through Egypt, that was, that was a huge famine. It destroyed kingdoms. That was a big deal. Um, but, uh, but you don't have any sense of that from, uh, from the sacred writings, except that they do tell, tell you certain details about the stuff which is valuable. So, so it all kind of comes together, I think. Okay, next week is interesting, but, but in a different way. Uh, because it's about this entanglement uh, business. Yeah, and uh, I know that sounds esoteric, it, but they did not award this for doing the physics of entanglement. They, they, they awarded it because of quantum computers come, that are based on it. And they realized that computers are about to undergo a huge revolution based on quantum physics. 
and um, it's a little like the awarding of the prize for black holes a few years ago, that, which is why Stephen Hawking lost out, because no one had actually seen a black hole. We had all kinds of theorists talking about black holes, but we didn't actually have a picture of a black hole. So no award to Penrose or Stephen Hawking. Then along comes this picture of something, I don't know how far away it is, but a long, long way away. And there's a picture of a black hole. And it absolutely, in its shape, obeys the rules of general relativity. That's a reason to award a Nobel Prize, because now you're not talking about fiction. You're talking about something that's real. And of course, now they're spotting them all over the bloody place. And every galaxy has got one at the, at the center of them. And that was another Nobel Prize that was awarded for that, or at least shared for that. So they tend to wait for evidence to, if this were just a quarrel between Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein, that wouldn't merit a Nobel Prize. But if it becomes a quantum computer, that makes it interesting. Hmm. Now, I actually, to the other side, I think it's far more interesting as a human story, talking about that, the, that, that early day stuff. And uh, I'm not so enthralled so far from what I've seen about the quantum computers, but you know, what do I know? Um, except that China, what a year ago, announced the first two quantum computers talking to one another, one in a satellite and one in a ground station. They're totally encrypted. There's no way you can break into them. Because if you try to break into them, the way goes in tangle. No entanglement. So they're unbreakable. So well, that's 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 next week. <laughs> that's, that's a good story. So yeah. as far as the DNA and the, the Neanderthals and the, yeah. that other group that you talked about. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. So at what point did, did something start to merge and humans start to look more like us? Uh, well, the, the Denisovans, if you go back in Africa, say 700 uh, to 900,000 years, I think it's a huge gap, isn't it? But if you go that far back, that's when the branch took place one to eventually right. become what we are, eventually, yeah. over 500,000 years. Yeah. And we don't have any of those intermediate steps. Yeah. And the other moved out of Africa to become first the Neanderthals, and then from that root stem, the Nisibans. So you're saying the branch out of Africa is completely different from close to so well, the, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans right. became what they became right. out of Africa. They did not evolve into their mature state. Uh, it's very important in this whole story to realize that, uh, that um, when we speak of a species like Neanderthals yeah. or our species, we, we use a, a, a certain card list of these are defining characteristics that define, define modern humans. But, but it's almost certainly wrong because we didn't acquire that full set of stuff overnight. We didn't, as uh, Richard Dawkins said one night, or one time in a, in a, in a talk, we didn't go to, to, to bed a, uh, as a preceding species and wake up the next day, or our children, as modern humans, that is, this stuff happened over there. When species evolve, they, they find little leashes and, 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 and certain characteristics develop. And, but it takes some time to acquire all of the characteristics that we consider the yeah. Amazon. So that's why I was pointing out this Moroccan one. No one seems to attain that, but that to me, when I look at that, I see a very close relative of Neanderthals in their uh, heaviness of the, of the skull, yeah. the brow, the longitudinal shape of the skull. As far as I'm concerned, that's, it's all in the family. Uh, but, um, but, but I think the more interesting question is, when did we become behaviorally modern? And I think 
the evidence there is much more recent. That would be maybe 100,000 years ago. And why would, and I'm saying that on what's the evidence for that? Uh, they have a well developed ochre industry, meaning they're making paints mm -hmm. and they're decorating and stuff. They're making jewelry. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, uh, they're using microlith technology to develop really uh, sharp and small weapons and tools. They're using insecticide. Figured out how to make that, and uh, and bedding, and uh, so the stuff they leave behind defines them, and suggests that they probably had uh, a well-developed imagination and creativity. Um, but I think to really take off, you need numbers. It's no good um, uh, inventing something on your own if somebody else doesn't multiply, if there isn't a multiplier effect. I mean, that's probably what did in the Neanderthals. Too few of them around to talk to or share stuff with any new technology. But humans, uh, we're, um, we, we've been on this exponential curve of the family getting larger and larger. And, I mean, uh, the community, the community getting larger and larger. And the tools for communicating becoming much better. So we share the technology and what we imagine much better. I noticed something in the New York Times today that uh, uh, two well-known museums are now highlighting AI for creative art. Now that's quite an interesting thing because uh, that's the change. In, you know, that's all part of the human evolutionary change and changing our habits and ways of thinking about things. And, uh, yeah, so, so 100,000, uh, could be earlier, but the fact is we can't find the stuff for, to, uh, there, there's a trail, so may, they may be, maybe they were Einstein's uh, 150 or 200,000 years ago, but sh show me the evidence, and there's no evidence, yeah. Yeah. On an administrative um, uh, note, um, will your uh, presentation, your slides, be available on the library's website? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, sure, I'll mention that to uh, The reason I ask, I know that some of your future ones would not be able to make, we've got other, but I'd love to be able to yeah, yeah, no, no, that's see, fine. The, see the material. That's fine. And, and it's on YouTube, too. Oh, even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't have to put up with me in person. Yeah. <laughs> you can actually click stop. <laughs> stop the ads. <laughs> I know you want to wrap this up, but you said you were going to ask us something at the beginning of your oh, talk. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, you know, I write these articles in the paper. Mm -hmm. Some of you may know that. Mm -hmm. And I get stopped a fair bit about those things. Just around the post office or wherever I am in town, and I thought, you know, that some of that stuff would be the makings of an interesting group, uh, discussion group, because you don't have to make up the material; the material exists, and and um, and if you look at the weekly paper, I mean, there. If you look back over a year or two, you. There are themes. I mean, I've been harping on this, when did we became human and that kind of thing, several times, touch and try that, usually provoked by something that came along to trigger it off again. And, but there are other things too, and I thought, you know, that would, be, that would be a really good thing. And usually groups that work for, that work for that kind of thing are maybe around 10 or 12. You know, small enough that you can see everyone else and everyone else but it's an interesting way to do it because the stuff is already there. Uh, and I know that they don't take it off the Lake Report site. Uh, it's, it's, it's all there, embarrassingly so. So if I say something wrong, uh, it's now been trying. But, but it's there, so it's accessible stuff. Yeah, so I, I was going to bring that up and, uh, and, and just ask if there's any. That would be maybe once a month or something. An interesting thing to do. Yeah.
Yeah. I've been hoping you would say that, that exact thing. <laughs> yeah. Because today is an example. We all would like to stay, I think, because you want to keep talking about these interesting yeah. ideas. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to and I did remember. <laughs> These days, that's the test. <laughs> oh, and you remember. Yes. Two of us remember. Thanks to my wife remembering. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right. Amazing. Thank you.